All right, so we're getting close to the end of the Canterbury Tales. We've got, this is our fourth set of notes before we hit the last one, which is, there'll be five. So we're going to do four characters today, four characters tomorrow. And this one probably for me is the most interesting section because you have your other two ideal characters, plus probably the most famous character in the entire Canterbury Tales, uh, you know, culturally that is, is well known, okay, for people who didn't read it. Uh, we're actually, and we're going to start with her. Her name's the Wife of Bath. And we're going to talk about her. She, we're actually going to read one of her. I think it's only the only tale of hers that stayed. But we got one of hers that we're going to look at uh, next week, along with the partner who we haven't met yet. We're going to look at two of their stories. So let's talk about the wife of Bath. So it says, A worthy woman from beside Bath City was with us, somewhat deaf, which was a pity. In making cloth she showed so great a bent, she bettered those of the press and yent. In all the parish, not a dame dared stir towards the altar steps in front of her. And if indeed they did, so wrath was she as to be quite put out of charity. So right away, what do we get out about this lady? Well, okay, she's deaf. Um, there's probably you know reasoning there. I, I don't know it, so we'll skip it. That's just kind of a trivia thing there. But we do know she's a great seamstress, all right? She's really good at it. It's indicating she's probably fairly wealthy. And then we see what happens at church. She will go before... Um, you know, the way it would work back then was the person who, the, the, the most, the people who held the most esteem in the community would go and, and give their money first. And it was really a thing to be seen. Like, here's how much I'm giving. It was a big thing about how much you put in the box and then on down the line in uh, the order of, you know, how important you were. So if anyone goes in front of her, she's so mad she refuses to give at all, which tells you right away she's not in it for the right reasons. Okay, that's a pride issue for sure. So we can maybe associate pride with her but she's got other issues pride's not the one i would give her by the way um it says her kerchiefs were of the finely woven ground sorry uh i dared have sworn they weighed a good 10 pound the one she wore on sunday on her head uh her hose were of the finest scarlet red and garnered tight her shoes were soft and new bold was her face handsome and red in hue Okay, so the term, the, the color red's mentioned twice there. Again, we have to look at writers about, like, if they're doing anything behind the scenes. And Chaucer very much so is using characterization to point to various things with these characters. And the wife of Bath, the color red is associated with her twice. The color red at times, it, it depends on the situation. I'm giving you just my version of this. The color red often is associated with promiscuity. So and that's backed up in the next couple of lines. So that's the thing. When you're wanting to make jumps like what I just did, you need proof to assume that's the case. And Chaucer follows us up right away with it, which makes me think that that's why he used the colors red. Because look at the next detail. He says, uh, A worthy woman all her life, what's more, she'd had five husbands all at the church door, apart from other company and youth. No need just now to speak of that, forsooth. So he points out she's been married officially five times and had a lot of other people that she's been with on the side. So the idea of being promiscuous definitely fits with that. So that... that interpretation holds up. You never want to make an interpretation with no support behind it. That's kind of the keys when you're looking at works like this, okay? So now we're looking at maybe not just pride, but maybe a little bit of lustfulness too. All right. Uh, he says, and she had been thrice, I'm sorry, and she had thrice been to Jerusalem, seen many strange rivers and passed over them. She'd been to Rome and also to Boulogne, St. James of Compostela and Cologne. And she was skilled in wandering, by the way. So she's gone on a lot of pilgrimages, again, showing her wealth. She's gone to all these places. And again, we've already seen that she's not doing this for the religious element. She's doing it for the status, for the pride of it. Again, you can use pride with her. Uh, pride and lust both go with her, all right? Um... She had gap teeth, set widely, truth to say. Easily on an ambling horse she sat, well wimpled up, and on her head a hat as broad as is a buckler or shield. She had a flowering mantle that concealed large hips. Her heels spurred sharply under that. Now, all of those things are, again, not all of them, but a lot of them also, again, point to uh, promiscuous nature. Gap teeth was something associated with that. Uh, she's got wide hips, which means, you know, for birthing children. So there's a lot of images of her that are, uh, again, aimed at the lustful side of things. By the way, I didn't mention this earlier, wife of Bath, it's because, if you notice from the wording, it's because she's from the city, all right, the city of Bath, and she's a wife from that city. It has nothing to do with 
a person's name, okay? All right, let's get the last one, which I do think that a lot of times this last one is hidden. It's it, First of all, high schools won't mention it because it is a little bit on the gross side. Second of all, I think a lot of professional people have, have just kind of skipped through this. Or they point to a more positive view of this, which I think is unfair considering what we've seen about this character. It says, in company she liked to laugh and chat and knew the remedies for love's mischances, an art in which she knew the oldest dances. So I read a lot of times that they're talking about like she knows how to deal with heartbreak here. I believe that it's more than that, okay? And again, I'm giving you guys the, you know, PG-13 version of this. I could definitely have said it was about heartbreak and make an argument for it. But honestly, love's mischances here and knowing remedies, remedies a medical term, So and love's mischances, it points to the idea about STDs, to be honest with you, that she uh, knows the, the old housewife cures for it. And it says an art in which she knew the oldest dances. In other words, she's, she's been through it is the way that you look at that. Now, when you look at those two interpretations, why go with the more disgusting of the two, which it definitely is, it's because it fits the rest of the description. There's nothing in here about her being a caring person who goes out and tries to help people with their heartbreak. There's more about an image of this woman as she gets around. So why is this character so famous? Because it's one of the more developed characters. And, of course, we do have one of her tales, which people like to. And we're going to get to read it uh, at a later date. So, All right, so wife of bath out of the way. Let's look next at the parson. The parson is the ideal first estate figure. He's your ideal clergyman, okay? Now, a parson would be the one of the lower rungs of the ladder, so that's part of the details before we get in here. And I want you to look, there's one main thing that, that that's like hit over and over about this guy that we'll talk about, okay? All right. A holy-minded man of good renown, there was a rich and there was and poor the parson to a town. Yet he was rich in holy thought and work. So he's poor. He, financially, he has nothing. But they say he's rich in thought and work. Now, again, we always want to be careful with Chaucer when we're first reading something to see if he's being serious or sarcastic. So we want to keep going. It says, uh, he also was a learned man, a clerk who truly knew Christ's gospel and would preach it, devalued parishioners, and teach it, okay? Still looking positive. It's like he's a smart guy, he studies, and not only, and this is the key thing that's, that's like his defining trait, is that he practices what he preaches, okay? Um, the benign and wonderfully diligent and patient when adversity was sent, for so he proved in great adversity. He much disliked extorting tithe or fee, nay, rather he preferred beyond a doubt giving to poor parishioners round about from his own goods and Easter offerings. He found sufficiency in little things. So like he doesn't do like the friar and try to extort money or the partner who we'll see later. He's not trying to extort money from people. He, in fact, gives his money away. The little bit he has, he's giving to people who are needy. Wide was his parish with houses far asunder, yet he neglected not in rain or thunder, in sickness or in grief, to pay a call on the remotest, whether great or small, upon his feet and in his hand a stave. So a parson would typically serve a lot of really small areas, and he would travel around and go to those, and they're saying no matter what, no matter how far the distance, if somebody needs him, he makes the trip. This would not be the case with most of the parsons at this time period. They would be like, I'm going to be here on Monday and here on Thursday. If, you're si if you get sick on Tuesday, I'll see you on the, on when we come back around. It was that sort of thing um let's see uh the stave the the image there of a shepherd that's important we're going to see several more like that it says this noble example to his sheep he gave first following the word before he taught it and it was from the gospel he had caught it this little proverb he would add there too that if gold rust then what will iron do for if a priest be foul in whom we trust no wonder that a common man should rust and shame it is to see, let priests take stock, a soiled shepherd and a snowy flock. So we got a lot in there that we should unpack. He's talking again about the importance of practicing what you preach and being a good model. And that image of gold, if gold was to rust, then what's iron going to do? Obviously gold doesn't rust. But he's saying that if the pastor or the preacher or the parson or the partner or the summer, you know, any of the religious figures, if they're corrupt, then what do you expect the average person to be? You can't expect them to live a holy life if their leader is not, and that's the point he's making. You get the shepherd imagery again because that's meant to tie this image to Jesus, okay? Um, this is the true example that a priest should give is one of cleanness, how the sheep should live. He did not set his benefits to hire or leave his sheep encumbered in the mire or run to London to earn easy bread by singing masses for the wealthy dead or find some brotherhood and get enrolled. 
So they're saying he doesn't do what most of the Parsons would do. You would start at the bottom and you would look for the first opportunity to kind of start climbing the ladder. And one of the things you could do is go and, you know, the, the rich would give you money to pay, or they would pay you to pray their loved ones out of purgatory or to get time off. And I know that's something that most of you have no concept of what purgatory is. And, uh, you know, it's not part of the Protestant faith, so I won't waste my time on it. But it is that's what the concept there and he also doesn't go and join some sort of brotherhood to help you know uh like it's like a church union to be honest with you is what it would be so he doesn't do any of that he stays it says he stayed at home and watched over his folds so that no wolf should make the sheep miscarry so he knows his job is to be there taking care of these people and that's what he does because he was a shepherd and no mercenary holy and virtuous he was but then never contemptuous of sinful men never disdainful never too proud or fine but was discreet in teaching and benign his business was to show a fair behavior and draw men thus to heaven and their savior unless indeed a man were obstinate and such whether of high or low estate he put to sharp rebuke to say the least they're saying he doesn't become contemptful of the sinful he doesn't reach out and try to like lecture them and, and berate them and treat them bad in fact he's very kind to everyone except when it gets to the point where he's and this is again a biblical thing that we kind of have lost track of today but the goal here is is that you want to change people's sinful behavior but if they don't you have to hold them accountable and that's what he's saying when the time comes he'll hold them accountable the key is he does it to the rich and the poor it's not just about what you know you know i'll let the rich get away with it because they can benefit me he's like i'll bust you no matter who you are and uh, that's key that's a big deal all right closing him up he says uh I think there never was a better priest. He sought no pomp or glory in his dealings. No scrupulosity had spiced his feelings. Christ and his twelve disciples and their Lord he taught but followed it himself before. There's that image again that he practices what he preaches. And we get no hint of sarcasm in this. This is the way the clergy should behave, whether they're the Pope or whether they're the poorest country parson. And that's one of the major messages. So if you get offended by the fact that, and we've got the two really bad ones still to come later, but get offended by how Chaucer just hammers the church, understand he has an opinion of what the church members should be or the clergy members should be. And that's ideal. That's what they should be, okay? So the Parsons are really good character. When I was in college, he's who I wrote my big uh, paper for this class. I did a whole class on this 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 thing we're covering and I wrote my paper on the parson and the parson's tale which is just a very extensive sermon but I, I like the parson at the time he was one of my favorite characters because you know he's an ideal figure but I'm gonna tell you I, my opinions have changed over time and the parson is now the number two best character in my opinion I know most of you would put him at one and there's nothing wrong with that because of the religious angle but I honestly believe this next guy the plowman should be the top billing and I'll tell you why all right, but let's read about him. He's very short, but uh, I love this character. It says, There was a plowman with him there, his brother. Many a load of dung, one time or other, he must have carted through the morning dew. Okay, so this is the parson's brother, the plowman, which those are good, good, like, uh, bookends here. You got the parson going around, the poor parson traveling and speaking, and you got this poor plowman, on the other hand, who's just going about his day to day, you know, the parson's taking care of his sheep, the plowman's taking care of his crops, you know. But notice the first thing they say about his job. He shovels cartloads of dung, which is, you know, animal feces or poop, if we want to be very uh, vulgar, okay? It says, uh, he was an honest worker, good and true, living in peace and perfect charity. And as the gospel bade him, so did he, loving God best with all his heart and mind, and then his neighbor as, as himself, repined at no misfortune, slack for no con content, uh, for steadily about his work he went to thrash his corn to dig or to manure or make a ditch okay so right away we get his day-to-day -day stuff he doesn't complain about it man what a model this is why i like this guy he's got really hard work it's not show up to school and do like maybe three classes of actual work while the other classes you know you're working on something in class or you have a project or it's an elective that you don't really do a lot in regardless he's showing up every day doing hard miserable work and he doesn't complain he smiles and he does what he's supposed to he just works and uh, does what he's been called to do, which is an attitude that every single person should accept and that very few of us, if any, actually do. This is why I like him so much. That, to me, is admirable. It says, um, let's see, where were we? And he would help the poor for love of Christ and never take a penny if he could help it. And as prompt as any, he paid his tithes in full what, when, when they were due on what he owned and on his earnings too. So he helps other people free of charge, which is, again is a thing I admire about him. So many of us are so worried about trying to make a buck that we'll, you know, even to our closest friends, we'll sell our services. Like, you know, if I like to do, uh, you know, 
I, I like to do carpentry. If I had the materials or somebody gave me the materials and asked me to build something for them, you know, half the time I would do it for free um, just because it's something nice to do. I know some people frown on that and feel like you're, you're somehow cheapening your work by not getting paid for it. But I mean, you know, there's a thing called charity and being nice. And even when people don't need the charity, still showing them that, hey, I love you and I care about you and I don't mind doing something for you. And that's a great thing about him. The thing about him paying his tithes, he doesn't just pay it. This would be the debate today. Do I pay my 10% on my before tax earning or of the money I bring home? That sort of debate, which believe it or not, happens a lot. They're saying he pays it on what he owes, so the money he makes, but also on the things like percentage of his house and things like that. The guy's giving more than he has to, in other words. Remember, he's got a poor job. He doesn't make much, but he's giving a lot. All right. Since he wore a tabard, smock, and rode a mare, there was a reeve, also a miller there, a college manciple from the ends of court, a papal pardoner, and in close consort, a church court summoner riding in a trot. And finally, myself, and that was the lot. Those last few lines are just kind of saying, oh, by the way, here's what's left. Okay, so that was all the, par uh, the plowman. So remember, the parson and the plowman are our ideal uh, first and third estate figures. I think I may have said second earlier, but the parson represents the first ideal, the plowman the third. Okay, let's get our last character now, the miller. And the miller is an infamous character, just like the wife of Bath. And the miller, because of the tale that's associated with him, is quite infamous, okay? So it says, the miller was a chap of 16 stone. If you look at the bottom, that tells you he is 224 pounds, which is big today, but definitely was big back then. It says, a great stout fellow, big and brawn and bone. He did well out of them, for he could go and win the ram at any wrestling show. So he's a, he's a scrapper. He's a fighter, all right? And he's good at it. Broad, knotty, and short-shouldered, he would boast he could heave any door off hinge and post or take a run and break it with his head. So he likes to knock doors down with his head. So he's an idiot, too, obviously. But again, it shows how uh, strong he is, I guess that's the best way to put it. Um, his beard, like any sour fox, was red and broad as well, as though it were a spade. And at its very tip, his nose displayed a wart on which there stood a tuft of hair, red as the bristles of an old sow's ear. So that he's not attractive. He's got a huge wart with a big hair coming out of it, so not a great look on a guy. Um, his nostrils were as black as they were wide. He had a sword and buckler at his side. He, his mighty mouth was like a furnace door. So, you know, he's got huge nostrils, and when it says his mouth was like a furnace door, it references he cusses a lot. All right, got a dirty mouth. A wrangler and buffoon, he had a store of tavern stories, filthy in the main. So he likes to tell dirty stories, too, uh, which his tale is one of those, by the way. Um, all right. his, was a, his was a master hand at stealing grain. He felt it with his thumb, and thus he knew of its quality and took three times his due, a thumb of gold by God to gauge an oat. So he's stealing. So when people bring him stuff, he's seeing what good grain is, and he's paying them less than what it's worth. Right? Uh, he wore a hood of blue and a white coat. He liked to play his bagpipes up and down, and that was how he brought us out of town. So he's the lead guy. He carries them all out playing his bagpipes. So uh, a good stereotypical figure. He's your typical, like, you know, working guy. It's good because we just had a comparison of the, the, like, ideal working class guy versus the stereotypical working class guy here. The guy who likes to get drunk, tell dirty stories, cusses a lot, and likes to fight, all right? Uh, his actual tale is pretty vulgar. Uh, it's one of those that whenever you t I tell people I'm teaching the Canterbury Tales that know it, I always wonder how I'm pulling that off. Well, it's because we don't teach his story and things like that. I mean, he's got it's got vulgarity like someone hanging their rear end out of a window and farting at people when they walk by. That's the kind of story. There's worse in it, but, I mean, that's there you go. That's the kind of story we would have with him. So don't think just today's stuff has grossness to it. In the 1300s, they were pumping out vulgarity, too. So that gives you your four characters that we have for today. Tomorrow, uh, when I film tomorrow's, we're going to get the Mansple and Reeve, who are very similar characters in a lot of ways. Now, they're going to be separate on the test, so don't worry. And then we're going to get the partner and the summoner, also two that go together, who will be separated, because I don't want you to make the mistake of confusing any of them. The partner and the summoner, the last two, are your two very evil characters, in my opinion. So something to look forward to tomorrow. And uh, then we'll be done with this. So keep on top of those notes. Keep on top of your questions. Be ready for the test on this, which is set for Friday. God willing, we don't have Hurricane Delta uh, right up our shoots. So hopefully that won't be an issue. Um, and we'll be able to get this out of the way. If not, we'll, hey, when we get back, we'll get to it then. All right? 
Okay, guys, well, have a wonderful evening, and thank you, excuse me, for the, for the time uh, for sitting down and watching this with me.